Wall Street Unplugged looks beyond the regular headlines heard on mainstream financial media to bring you unscripted interviews and breaking commentary direct from Wall Street right to you on Main Street. How's it going out there? It's April 17th. I'm Frank Kersey, host of the Wall Street Unplugged podcast, where I break down the headlines and tell you what's really moving these markets. On Saturday, I took my kids to the Clay County Fair. It's located in northern Florida, Jacksonville, mostly a farm area, though. And I don't know if you've ever been to one of these big fairs. I've been going to them since I was a kid, where I used to spend every summer in a place called Stanford, New York, which is about 30 miles away from Oneonta. A lot of people are familiar with Oneonta College, one of the biggest party colleges. But every summer from the age, I'd say, five or six to 17, so we lived in Queens, and we had, you know, my parents bought an up, upstate house, and we used to go there. Well, me, my brother, and my sister, as they grew up, they kind of, you know, started staying in Queens, New York, when they were teenagers and stuff. But yeah, I was stuck there for a good 10, 11 years, and you know, every summer when we had off from school, that's when we used to head up there, and we used to come back like a week before school started. So you know, it was a farm area. It was really nice. It was really cool, and they had two major fairs by us. And one was called Delaware County Fair, which was in Walton, New York. And the other was called the Skihari County Fair, which was in Cobleskill, and not too far. And these fairs were amazing. And they had tons of games, rides. They had animals everywhere, pigs, rabbits, chickens, roosters, goats, horses, cows, everything. And, yeah, they held contests like, you know, best in show. And they had major events. It was a truck pulls. And they had dog shows, talent shows. And the greatest thing... I don't even know if they have these anymore, that they were called demolition derbies, where they would line up, you know, they have cars that are basically stripped down. They paint numbers on the door. They had no glass in their windows or anything. Uh, and, and these cars would basically start on each side of the stadium, which cut down to like a 100-yard field, and then they would smash into each other as hard as they can. they keep banging against each other bang, until – the car was totally disabled. It didn't work anymore. And, you know, the winner was the one that the car that actually was functional was still running. And they had like 10 rounds with the winners of each round competing against each other for, you know, the big trophy. And I mean, it was pretty crazy. Cars used to go on fire. They had fire departments on standby. Uh, I've seen plenty of cars go on fire. They had ambulances there. Uh, I never saw anyone get hurt, but I don't know. I haven't really seen these lately at any fairs, but man, I mean, demolition derbies, forget it. The amount of people that lined up, it was, it was awesome. And, and when I was a kid, you know, going to that upstate house every summer, I would look forward to these fairs. I mean, it was the biggest thing in the world to me. So I wanted to save up as much money as possible. This way I can go on all the rides and play all the games. So my dad used to give me tons of chores to do. I'd right, start the summer. You know, pay me like five dollars an hour, and we had a six-acre ranch upstate, you know, in the middle of nowhere. It was really nice, and we had our own pigs, chicken, roosters that we used to get from the farm every year. And it was kind of funny since my dad used to feed these animals our leftovers every night. So burgers, hot dogs, you know, after barbecues, macaroni and cheese, beans every single night. So you know, the animals that we got for this date like kings, and. We used to get the animals from the same farm at the beginning of the summer, and by the end, we gave them back, and they were all, like, fat and plumped up. <laughs> you know, they, just, they just ate everything, you know? So, yeah, my dad was really into that stuff. And, you know, we did this for over 10 years to the point where, you know, when we got to the farm, I'm sure the animals were like, no, pick me, pick me. <laughs> Usually when you go to the farm and pick animals, you go home, you kill them, and you cook them. We used to take them and feed them and get, you know, fat. So, you know, these animals kind of loved us. But anyway, uh I would save, you know, a couple of hundred dollars doing all my chores, which was, you know, feeding a lot of these animals, mowing the lawn, chopping wood for our fireplace. And, and you know, I'd take this money and go to these fairs at least twice because they would go on for a week at a time. You know, so I'd attend at least, you know, twice a week and, and, you know, just have a ball, like play games, win prizes, go on rides, meet friends. You know, it was really the highlight of my summer as a kid. Well, when you look at the Clay County Fair in Florida I just went to, this was a really large fair. Now, this was more than 30 rides, most of adult rides, tons of games, food, animals, tractor pulls, everything. And I have to tell you, I, the total attendance from last year, I looked it up. So this is the amount of people who attended the fair for the full week. It broke 300,000. I'm sure this year it broke 500,000. And because Saturday alone, the place was insane. I mean, I've never seen anything like this before. 
at least at a fair. Each person I paid ten dollars to get in. The kids over five year old, five years old, I think, under five, they got them for free. Over five, for five to ten years old, I think, was seven dollars each. And then you had to pay twenty five dollars to get a band that you will have access to all the rides. And we waited online, my wife and I, and the kids. We waited online for forty minutes just to get the bands for the kids. Not a ride, just to get the bands. Which, by the way, these a holes. Sorry to curse. Took a page from the health insurance companies, right? <laughs> Where they give you a bracelet, you have to give access to every ride, but they actually did not give you access to every ride. They give you access to every single ride except the three most popular ones, and those rides require you to pay in tickets, and it was eight tickets per ride, and each ticket was a dollar. So if you wanted to go on the other rides, you had to pay extra, almost double, you know, what, what the bracelet cost. And every single one of these rides, every one of them, had 40-minute-plus waits, most of them over an, an hour. This is a fair. This isn't Disney World. So last year, the Clay County said it generated $2.3 million, and this was just on food, beverage, specialty concessions, carnival rides. This number, I wouldn't be surprised if it's close to $4 million this year. So I went to this event last year. It was nothing, nothing like this year. In fact, it was definitely the most crowded fair I ever saw. As someone who's been going to these things for 30 years, practically. I mean, half an hour lines to get food. Lines for every ride. Every game was $5 to play. $5 minimum. Remember when it used to be 50 cents and a dollar or, you know, $2, you get two balls. and No, everything was $5. And every game was jam-packed. And I tweeted this at Frank Kersey. If you want to follow me, I'm starting to tweet a lot more. It's my handle. You know, so I tweeted this when I was at the fair that those of you who don't believe the economy is on the brink of recession, right? You may want to take a look at this. And I provided pictures and a lot of data I just mentioned. And it was funny because one person responded and they were like, really, Frank, this one data point makes you think the economy is fine? <laughs> no, it's not one data point. Sorry. Sometimes I assume that, you know, everyone's part of the whole system, the whole ecosystem that we have here where, you know, you listen to the podcast, listen to newsletters. We have a massive network that goes up to 100 countries, uh, which is incredible. I mean, the podcast has been downloaded, uh, I believe, over 8 million times, even more than that, uh, which is kind of humbling and incredible. But a lot of people, you know, write in. So it's not just one data point. I mean, the powerful network that we have here, you know, I get dozens, if not hundreds of emails from you guys every week. And I would say over 90%, probably like 95% of everyone emailing in, that's frankcurseyresearch.com. I encourage you to email, right? We're all together in this. We're all a big network. But 95%, pretty close, definitely over 90% have been positive. I mean, tell me that, hey, you know what, Frank? Business is still strong because I ask a lot of business owners out there. So it's slowing from last year, but it's still solid, right? You know, with tax reforms and stuff like that, people are spending a little bit more money. You know, listeners write in and tell me about the housing markets they live in outside of very high end homes and you know these major metropolitan areas starting to come down in price the housing market is pretty solid real estate agents are telling me there's still very little inventory on the market it's hard to get houses to even sell that's what i'm hearing out there again maybe if if this is different email me this isn't you know i'm not biased i'm not a permable or perma bear this is me reporting real time real time data from you guys you know this is what i'm hearing Emails from people shopping at malls, traveling the world, talking to cab drivers, going to tourist destinations, even taking cruises. And overwhelmingly, these emails are positive. I'm just telling me things are crowded. People continue to spend money. And, and, and look, we all know it's not always going to be this way. I mean, you may be worried about a massive debt, a trade war with China, Brexit, slowdown in earnings growth, right? All those, yeah, you know, we know those are on the table. But right now, people are spending money. The sentiment is overwhelmingly positive. We all know this could change, but right now things are pretty good. We're seeing it recent earnings from banks where you know most saw declines in trading volumes from January, February, mostly January. Most every management team said the economy is, is pretty strong and consumers continue to spend. As you'll see personally in almost every area you go to, malls, big fairs, car dealerships, vacations. Yeah, car dealerships, yeah, you're selling a little bit, but still people are buying cars like crazy. Everything's crowded. And why am I going through this? Why am I telling you this story? Because it's very important, guys. Because when consumers decide to cut back on spending, when they start getting worried, when they are no longer traveling, buying homes, you know who's going to see it first? You. If you're paying attention. 
Not that the economists that stick their heads in books and look at bell curves, all those guys have been wrong because most of those guys, and I'm not picking on all of them and not every one of them, but the people they talk to are usually rich people. These are lots of cells in the room. They're not socially inept. You know, they're looking at numbers and stuff like that. You are out there. You are seeing your neighbors. Who's buying cars? Who's spending money? The house is for sale. How much milk costs? How much gasoline costs? You're it. Now, times that about like the massive network we have and the real-time data that we get on indications of the economy, I can't tell you since I've been doing this podcast how incredible that's been. It's a reason why I've been so bullish in the face of how many people telling us the market's going to crash because I'm a data-driven guy. I'm listening to my network. I listen to the people I talk to. I travel like crazy. This is how you get a good indication. I mean, look at the credit crisis where home prices start to collapse Tons of foreclosures hit the market. You guys knew about it. If you live in Florida, Southern California, Vegas, you saw this happening in late 2006. Nobody was talking about it. You saw it happening. The houses for sale, people, you know, 2004 or five, people that you know are cops and firemen buying $800,000 houses with Mercedes in their driveways. You saw it. And you saw it happening in 2006, how you know, this started shrinking, people just leaving their house, more foreclosures on the market. You definitely saw it in 2007. The rest of the world pretty much found out about it in, in, in early 2008. But the writing was on the wall if you just looked. And tons of houses for sale. New homes that were just built. They're on the market for six to nine months, even longer. Nobody buying them. So right now, based on what I'm seeing from my here, from my network, some of that travels, the economy's fine. It's not great, but it's doing okay. By almost every economic data being reported, and by a much more important measure, the common sense point of view from someone you know, who travels a ton, talks to locals, talks to cab drivers, has a nice network of people spread out through 100 countries, and from someone who just went to a local fair in the middle of nowhere in a farm town where they're going to generate close to $4 million in a week record sales on a freaking fair? Are you kidding me? The economy looks pretty healthy right now. I expect to stay away at least through the end of this year. Again, if you're against this or you're a perma bear or whatever, that's fine. That's okay. Make sure you have stop losses on your stop. I'm just telling you the data that's reported. I'm not biased here. I look at data, and that's how I get to my investments. That's how I recommend stocks in our newsletters. But as for the economy, if you're worried about it, it's going to be strong to at least the end of this year, likely through 2020 as well. Can't see it's really falling into a recession 2020 into election year. I think it's going to happen do everything we can to stimulate the economy. But that's the basis for this whole story and telling you all this stuff, that keep your eyes out. You guys know more than most of the economists, most of the analysts out there. If you just look, you'll find great ideas. Listen to your kids. They know the biggest trends that are coming up. They know about the Instagrams and stuff. They know about all social media sites. They know about Fortnite and things that you know become billion-dollar things that, that most people don't have a clue about until it's too late. So these things – are much, much bigger, and these stocks go through the roof. But keep your eyes out. Trust me. It'll definitely help you become a better investor. So the great interview set up for today, it's with Edward Carr, who's the president and CEO of a junior mining company called U.S. Gold Corp. This is a company where I did a lot of research on. I actually went to the site, saw the properties, met the whole management team, met the top geologist, recommended the stock, and we wind up stopping out, which you know happened with a lot of our mining picks. We're very smart to stop out. A lot of these things got nailed much, much harder because, hey, it's a cyclical downturn. It's horrible right now. I miss time the market. For the past couple of weeks, I've been running a lot of companies, a lot of good CEOs in the mining industry. Again, it's an industry that's just been decimated outside of a little stretch in 2016. But going back to 2012, especially junior miners, have gotten absolutely crushed. Names that I thought were buys down 80% with good management teams and good projects went down another 20, 30%. We stopped out of some of these names. But U.S. Gold is a good company. Again, I've done the research on it. Edward Carr is here to give you an update what's going on. Talk about his recent hire to the board. It's a big name. He's in Trump's cabinet. I believe he's going to be a game changer. He's going to highlight some of the short, long term catalysts of the company. Edward's been on before. He's a sharp guy. He founded several investment management, investment banking firms based in Switzerland. It's going to be a great interview. Definitely listen up. It's a name to put on your radar. And then my educational segment, I'm going to teach you how to make money buying and selling stocks just before they report earnings. 
If you follow me at Frank Curzio, I said that this is a loser's game. It's a coin flip. But I know so many of you love to do it. And I've done it before, too. You know, just gauge where you have a good idea of the company's going to put strong earnings or weak earnings. But I'm going to show you how to put those odds more in your favor. And it's going to be a cool segment because I'm going to provide a list of names, probably like, I would say, 20 plus that are going to report next week. And I'm going to select a few of them, maybe five or six, and tell you which ones you should buy into the quarter, which ones you should short to the quarter. Pretty crazy, but listen to what I have to say. It's very important because, again, you're going to push the odds in your favor if you engage this correctly. It's a lot more than what the company does or what's going on or who the management team is. No, this is about trading. I get a lot of calls in. I get a lot of people, hey, Frank, you focus on trading segments. There's going to be a trading segment. I'm going to highlight lots of stocks that are reporting next week and which ones I think are going to beat the quarter and go higher and which ones report weak earnings and go lower. So definitely stay tuned for that list. And again, I'll break down at least five companies, maybe seven or eight, depending on how much time I have. But definitely give the segment a listen. And before I share that list of stocks with you, Let's get to my interview with Edward Carr. Edward Carr, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast. Hey, Frank. Thanks so much for having me. It's always great to be here. Uh, it's cool. So, so I want to start off talking about the macro, which I kind of do with everyone in, in the mining space, because it's something that's been absolutely horrible. It looks like things are going to turn the past couple of years. We know that their you know, CapEx spending has decreased significantly. There hasn't been a lot of major discoveries. And some of these junior miners like yourself have, have, have tons of potential. But I want to hear from you as someone who travels the world, and you do this interview for, from Switzerland. Uh, what are you hearing out there in terms of investors? Are, are the institutions starting to get in? Is there still a liquidation process going on? Because this is a cyclical industry. It's supposed to be. But right now, the decline, I mean, this decline, talking to professionals, I mean, it's, it's just, they haven't seen anything like this for 30, 40 years. Uh, what are you hearing out there to, to say, hey, you know what, maybe now's the time to really at least start buying into some of these really great names like, you know, maybe your company? Yeah, it's it's been such a such a difficult time, Frank, over the last, you know, seven, eight years, really since the peaks of 2011. Um, we've had multiple different head fakes uh, thinking that gold's going to break out. Here it goes. Here it goes. And, you know, what happens, as you well know, too, is that a lot of us in the industry get pretty biased because we really believe in gold. We believe it is a currency. It's tangible. It's got real, real purchasing power protection for the longer term. Um, but it just it hasn't broken out the metal yet the way a lot of people have thought. And, you know, we're sitting here today on the 17th of April 2019 with like a 2078 gold price. Um, that's down from 1350 not too long ago. So we've actually sold off. It seems like the equity markets in general are back in a risk on atmosphere. Um, there was a little nervousness, you know, from that big equity sell off back in December into January and gold had a nice pop on kind of like the fear trade, but now it's risk on. We actually this morning had a, uh, had a pretty decent GDP print out of China. So it seems like Chinese growth is uh, coming back alive. Maybe the trade wars have not been uh, that, that difficult for the Chinese and the Chinese economy. But at the same time, there's other signs out there that not everything's rosy. Um, we actually had German growth in Europe this morning show one of the slowest pace in the last six, seven years. So the European economy, the European ship is definitely taking on water. Um, we got major issues there. We still have massive issues around the world, as you know, Frank, with quantitative easing, central banks from the BOE, the BOJ, the European Central Bank, the U.S. Fed, even the Chinese Central Bank, you know, printing, printing currencies ad infinitum to try and fight economic downturns. And it's just not going to end well in the long term. You know, it really won't. So I, I think we're, we're getting close to an incredible buy again here in gold, in the gold uh, mining and exploration companies, there is the old saying and the old adage, sell in May and go away. So the equity markets, they're, they're up at about an all-time peak when you look at your big bang stocks. You know, again, as the contrarian, I think some of your subscribers and investors, they should probably be taking profits in some of the big large cap technology names, some of their stocks that are up at 52-week highs. And you look at the mining and exploration sector, most of these companies have great fundamental value and are down near 52-week lows, including U.S. Gold Corp., by the way. 
Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's, it doesn't even matter, right, at this point, whether it's a good project, if it's a great management team and a mind-friendly jurisdiction. I mean, that that's why, you know, over the past few months, I've been getting a lot of, you know, just CEOs from junior miners saying, hey, guys, make sure you put these companies on your list because, you know, you don't really need the cycle to change where it's, it's – you just need a little bit of positive sentiment and, and where you guys are at and, and, and all these companies are at, I mean, you'll see, you know – easily doubles and triples from, from these levels. I mean, that, that's, I mean, you see a lot more than that when the cycle turns, but I, I wanted to ask you this question when it comes to gold, is it about the stock market? I mean, does the stock market need to crash or, or go a lot lower for gold to work because right now that seems like, you know, that that's one of the catalysts, right? For, for gold, right? You want to see, you know, inflation is, is a factor depending on what period you look at. Deflation could be a factor, but yeah, I know that is really a thesis for gold. But when I look at it, just from a fundamental standpoint, um, it seems like that there's plenty of catalysts here where the big guys need to find gold. They haven't been able to find major projects, and there's a lot of junior miners, you know, that that are sitting on potential, you know, big projects here. Is it is it more about fundamentals, or is it strictly like, hey, we really need stocks to go lower in order for gold to work? Yeah, it's it's a little bit of both, and there'll be multiple catalysts out there that could ultimately ignite the bonfire for a big gold rally. Um, if the global equity markets pull back, certainly you know, that, that would cause a flight to safety and gold would catch a bid and probably really start to take off. Uh, geopolitical concerns, you know, the Middle East is as crazy as ever. Um, something happens there and there could be a big flight to gold. You look at some of the smart money out there in the world, uh, the Chinese central bank, the Chinese government, the Russian central bank, you know, they have just been hoovering up all of the gold ounces and they, uh, as they can. And they've been accumulating, accumulating, accumulating. You know, the U.S. dollar had a heck of a nice run because the Federal Reserve was tightening interest rates. But now the Fed's done a complete 180. They stopped tightening and they might even reduce interest rates by the end of 2019. There is an election coming up in 2020. So not that the Fed's political, but they probably want the economy to be going pretty well. So we'll see what happens. And in that sort of environment, gold should do pretty well. And at some point, probably the U.S. dollar would roll over. And if that happens, gold would look really, really good as well, too. So, you know, multiple different catalysts that can really um, put in place a prolonged bull market rally, which at some point will be coming. Yeah, and there's a reason, guys, Trump is yeah, – every other tweet is about the Fed. This isn't about now. This is all strategy for next year where, hey, you better not raise rates during the election year. So – because, you know, that's one of the things with the economy. If the economy is well, you know, that incumbent president almost, almost gets elected. <laughs> and all those tweets are, exactly. are more of a much bigger picture. It's not just for today. But um, all right, so let, let's get to U.S. Gold Corp. This is a company that, you know, you guys were nice enough to, to, to fly me down. I went down there to, to see the project uh, – uh, tell me what's going on with, with, with your company and, and maybe start from the beginning because, you know, let's assume that that no one's really familiar with this company and they didn't listen to your past interviews or anything like that on the podcast. But why don't you start uh, from the yep. beginning with U.S. Gold Corp? Sure. Be happy to, Frank. So U.S. Gold Corp., we are a publicly traded company on the NASDAQ. We're one of the very few gold exploration companies listed on the NASDAQ. Our symbol is USAU, so U.S. Gold. And that's really our mission. We are going after high potential assets and properties in the United States. We currently today have two projects within U.S. Gold Corp. Copper King is our more advanced, and we know there's an existing deposit. We know there's an existing resource at Copper King. Uh, we have a technical report called the PEA, Preliminary Economic Assessment, that shows our metal in the ground at Copper King. It's about 1.1 million ounces of gold and 300 million pounds of copper. And um, that has a $178 million net present value on the project at 1275 gold and 280 copper. So the prices we're at today. And then we have this big, massive exploration, what I call an exploration unicorn, because I believe it could really one day make us a unicorn. Uh, in Nevada, uh, the project's called Keystone. It is a district scale property, means it's good size, 12,000 acres. Uh, about 20 square miles, 650 mining claims on the Cortez Gold Trend in north central Nevada. We are just 10 miles south of Barrett Gold's Cortez Hills Complex at the Cortez Mine across the valley pipeline mine, two of the biggest mines in North America. Keystone's been identified and consolidated by our head geologist, Dave Mathewson. He's had a lot of success. 
He's been on and off this project and property for the last 30 years, and he believes it's the best exploration project he has seen in his career. We believe there are uh, multiple world-class discoveries at Keystone, like the Cortez Hills deposit just to the north of us, and we are out trying to uh, ultimately prove up one of those discoveries with a big major drill hole discovery. Yeah, and, and even with Dave Matheson, someone that I know very well and that you know and met personally uh, on my trip there. Uh, when you say this is one of the the biggest projects, like, yeah, you know, he says this is one of the, the best exploration projects he's seen. We're talking about a guy with 35 years of exploration experience, uh, former head of Newmont's uh, uh, Nevada exploration team. I mean, this is a guy that had, that that's you know credited for for you know big discoveries in this area. So it's it's not just you know hey a guy that's been a geologist for a couple of years, right? I mean, this is a guy that that uh, that has tremendous experience specifically in Nevada. That's exactly it, Frank. And you know, I I don't want to brag or boast, but I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find people more experienced than Dave Matheson in Nevada. You could count them on your right hand. I mean, he's one of five people with that level of experience, level of success. Dave has found multiple deposits in his career. He's created tremendous shareholder value. He not only does he know Keystone, Dave is literally a walking encyclopedia of every project in Nevada. He lives, breathes, eats, sleeps gold exploration. You know, Dave looks at all the other companies, all the other projects, watches them very closely, has tremendous knowledge, knows the history of probably every single project out there. And he is so impressed with Keystone. I mean, we've been at it, Frank, and you know, you've been out on the project and you've seen the property. We've been at it out there now going on three years. And gold exploration is a process. You know, your subscribers need to know and understand this takes time. Uh, okay, you could have a lottery ticket where you just go out and drill a hole and hit a major discovery, but that's very unusual. What you have to do is find a prospective project like Keystone in a great neighborhood, and then we go out, we do a tremendous amount of field work through geology, through mapping, through geophysics, through geochemistry, to really understand, you know, is this project viable? And then we bring out the drills and we start drilling to understand, do we have the right host rocks? Because these big major gold deposits in Nevada, these Carlin type deposits, they are hosted in very, very specific limestone carbonates. So we drilled kind of a grid pattern, north, south, east, west at Keystone, what Matthewson would call scout hole drilling. And sure enough, the results came back spectacular. 2,000 feet of some of the best host rocks Dave Matheson has seen in his career. Incredible upper plate, lower plate, wind band, uh, primary hosts for the Cor Cortez Hills deposit. We have the exact same rocks at Keystone. They've been incredibly altered. That alteration, Frank, it means the rock is like baked and busted up. And that happens from the heat engines. We know at Keystone there are multiple intrusives. These were ancient volcanoes. We actually sponsored a master thesis study over two years to study these ancient volcanoes academically. We dated them. We counted them. And we know now specifically they are the exact same age and from the exact same geological system as the intrusive at Cortez Hills to the north. This is very positive for us. Those, those ancient volcanoes on the Keystone Project, they have erupted multiple times. And as they have, that eruption and pulsation has pushed the gold out into the host rocks. So all of our drill holes have shown us anomalous gold. We know there's gold in the rock. We know the rock has been really beat up. Now, the real goal in this business is to drill into one of those high-grade feeder zones uh, Cortez Hills deposit to our north, it is basically a really high grade brush of pipe. So it's a very, very small, narrow deposit, about a 500 foot signature at surface. So in a 20 square mile property package, that's like trying to put a shot on a target a thousand yards downrange. You know, you got to be extremely accurate. But we are narrowing in on that right now. We think we are extremely close. We had a couple of big events happen at Keystone last year. 
Number one, we got approval of our environmental assessment and plan of operations. That opened up the entire district for us for exploration. Before that, we were working off four very small permits called notices of intent. So we only had kind of a freckle on a human body. We could only use a very, very small portion of our land package. Now we can go anywhere. We drilled six holes last fall, kind of targeted holes, and then the snows came to Nevada. It's up in the mountains at altitude, and we had to demobilize because we, we got snowed out. Um, and we are putting together our 2019 exploration program right now. We probably can get back out on the project in June, and we are at the point where it's really an American football analogy. We're first in goal. You know, we believe we're going to have four downs to put the ball in the end zone, and we're going to win. We are very, very close, we believe, to vector in to a major discovery. So it's an exciting time. So, you, you know, you mentioned drilling results and stuff like that, and then you got to drill further, which costs money. So how does that work where you know, you're in an environment where it's not the easiest to raise money? And talk about that because, you know, sometimes when, when I have CEOs come on, it, it's, hey, everything's great. But, you know, when, when it comes to this industry, it's not that – easy to raise money unless you have good projects and you guys have been successful. So how are you on the money front in terms of having the money to drill these extra holes and really dig in further? Because like you said, if you hit one of these things, we're not talking about something that's going to go up 5x. We're talking about something that's going to go up 20x, 30x, 40x if you guys do hit a keystone. Right. And you're exactly right. This is one of the most challenging capital markets for all companies out there. Very difficult to raise money. Most of the major institutional investors, the big gold funds and resource funds in the space, they've had redemptions because FANG stocks are running, marijuana stocks are running, whatever it is, everything but gold's running. So the investors are throwing out the baby with the bathwater in the gold sector. So there's not a lot of capital available from the institutional front. However, there's still plenty of pools of money out there. We have been successful so far at U.S. Gold Corp in our history in funding this company, we've raised about $24, 25000000 million of capital um, in the last three years. And myself, Frank, my background, I'm not a geologist. I'm a finance guy. So I really look very, very closely at our cap table and at our structure. Today, we only have about 19.3 million shares out, and it's all plain vanilla. This is common stock. There's no ratchets. There's no resets. There's no exploding warrants or any funny stuff in there, 19.3 million shares. Our stock somewhere around a buck. So we have a $19 million market cap. We have over $3 million in cash on our last filing. So a $16 million enterprise value. I really believe, and I've been successful in getting investors to believe, that our NASDAQ listing, our Copper King asset in Wyoming, and our cash is worth more than our market cap today. And then Keystone becomes the cherry on top of the ice cream sundae. You know, you get that for free. So the institutions have been tough. We have some very, very uh, supportive shareholders that have been along for the ride that know Dave Matthewson really well. You know several of them, Frank. They're very committed to the company. Myself, I'm a significant investor. I've participated personally in every placement we've done and have bought stock out of the market. So even though it's difficult, I, I still believe we will be able to raise the capital we need on some pretty decent terms. And because of the drilling results and everything that's going on, one of the things I like to see, especially with, with, with small companies, right, really small companies, is yeah, you know, the management team who's involved. And you guys just had a recent hire that that you know we talked about. That that's amazing. Could you you talk about that person? Because I think. To me, it's a game changer. It puts credibility on it in an industry where there's not a lot of credibility in a lot of these junior minor stocks where, you know, we've seen that before. I've been lied to straight up by CEOs and things like that. But you really want to put together, you know, good companies in your portfolio. And I think this really helps with a small company like yours because, you know, this hire w w w was, it's, again, I think it's a game changer. Why don't you talk a little bit about it? Yeah, and we're, we're really excited. We announced yesterday that former Secretary, Secretary of the Interior, uh, Ryan Zinke has joined U.S. Gold Corp. as a director. Uh, so former Secretary Zinke, uh, you know, he's got tremendous experience. Uh, his knowledge of mining and the resource industry in the United States is excellent. He's also, he has a degree in geology. He's from Montana. 
so he understands the Western American mindset. Um, he was a former Navy SEAL for many, many years, so he has tremendous leadership skills. And as you point out, Frank, you know, for for a cabinet level secretary to join a nineteen million dollar nano cap company, we're, we're really proud of that because Secretary Zinke also had to do his due diligence on us. He's not just going to go out and put his name on anything. And um, we think that he'll be able to provide a lot of value, a lot of leadership. Um, I really look forward to, to him giving me guidance as a board member for moving Copper King along towards a permitting uh, decision. And uh, yeah, we're, we're just so, so, so excited to have him join our team. Now, and I did, you know, I was doing some research on him, incredible background. And this is important because, you know, you, I know you're familiar with cryptos as well. We've talked about the crypto markets together. And uh, when people just hire someone to be an advisor or something, I mean, the person's not, it's just a name and you probably don't have any contact with the person. It's more to sell the deal or whatever. But I mean, he has, like you said, an extensive background. He served on the House Armed Services and, and Natural Resource Committees, uh, like you said, geologist background, but, you know, Navy SEAL, acting commander of Special Forces in Iraq, awarded the Bronze Star for combat in Iraq, is credited with uh, conducting 360 combat missions and the capture or kill of 72 terrorists. Uh, that's 72 terrorists. Re retired active duty 2008, became a, a you know, state center of Montana. But, I mean, this guy has a, a background in what you do. It's not just, hey, we got, a, you know, someone from Trump's cabinet, now he's on a board. I mean, this person has a lot of experience in this industry, doesn't he? He really does. He really does. Tremendous experience in the industry. You know, knows it extremely well. Um, there's probably not many former congressmen, senators that understand the mining industry as well as uh, former Secretary Zinke does. So we are so pleased to have him. And just his, his, his gravitas that he brings to the board, you know, people look at us probably in a different light now and say, wow, you know, look at this. He's joining U.S. Gold Corp. Um, what does he see? Why, what should we be looking at here? And and trust me, you know, I, you, you know me, Frank, I'm I'm not excited to be the CEO of a 19 million dollar market cap company. I mean, we all want to really make something out of this. It's a challenging industry, but we're certainly putting together a team of accomplished operators and we want to take this forward to the next level. And Secretary Zinke is going to be a big part of that with us. All right, let's finish with this, too. So if, if investors are looking to, to buy your stock today, uh, you know, and you're positive on it again, what are some of the callus that they can look forward to, which is important because, you know, in a market like this and say just, you know, gold is weak for the next year or two, when you have no news on your stock and no real catalyst, I mean, those are the stocks that get hit the hardest. What are some of the like the short term, long term things drilling, you know, that, that, that people can look forward to if they buy your stock today? Yeah, we're going to we're going to certainly move forward on our exploration plans, both for Copper King in Wyoming and Keystone in Nevada. Um, all of your subscribers should watch for our news and our press releases coming out. We'll put out press releases detailing exactly what we plan to do in 2019. There'll be maps showing everyone where we plan to go and exactly where we think that X marks the spot on the treasure map. So that is coming up in the next couple of months. You'll see activity at both projects. Um, and we're always on the lookout. We're on the lookout for other opportunities since this industry is so beat up and so washed out, uh, there's a lot of other acquisition targets that are out there on our radar. And uh, if we can do anything to uh, add to shareholder value and really try and uh, bring in additional assets to, uh, uh, to help the overall company and shareholder base, we are certainly going to do that. So it's going to be a very, very active late spring and summertime program for us, Frank. Now, it sounds great. And I want to finish with... Uh... A question from out of left field, a little bit out of left field, because I want to get your thoughts since you, you know, you travel the world and you're in Switzerland, uh, and, and we love to discuss cryptocurrencies. So I always like to to get one last question, and it has nothing to do with the company or anything, but more about personal. What do you see in, in cryptocurrencies? Because I know this is a market that you follow. I know it's a market that you invest in. Uh, in terms of international demand, where you know, you know that we just launched a, a security token offering that that's still in the works, and so far it's doing very well. We raised over four million in capital. And uh, but what are you seeing in the industry compared to, you know, you've been through this whole entire thing where, you know, 2018 was great, late 2017 and everything really crashed. But what are you seeing internationally? Because that's where the demand is really continues to come from. And I just feel like the U.S., you know, is a little bit lagging in this area. Yeah. And 
trust me, it, it, the, the one analogy I'd say is that the crypto market will look very, very similar to the internet market from the 90s. You know, we had this incredible boom in the 90s. Anything with a dot com and its name just flew up and went up 10, 20, 30 times. And then 1999, bang, the big NASDAQ crash uh, wipes out most of the companies and you're left with five or six major dominant players of the internet business, you know, the, the Googles, the Amazons, the, the Facebook, the Ebays, whatever of the world. So I think the crypto business is going to be exactly the same. A lot of these ICOs uh, just really leveraged off the success of the crypto industry. There was way too much hype, way too much speculation. A big, massive washout is positive long term. But the one thing I can guarantee you and su your subscribers, Frank, is that blockchain technology that is here to stay and that is going to revolutionize our lives uh probably the way that the internet did originally in the 90s um the applications on everything from trade finance to banking to identity verification uh to any sort of paper document that can be tracked with blockchain technology is amazing and we've seen this industry evolve from, you know, just the creation of some cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, the first one, to ICOs, initial coin offerings, and everyone got excited. And now it's evolving more maturely towards STOs that businesses like yours, Frank, are actually doing a security token offering. You're allowing subscribers to become an equity shareholder in one of the most dynamic, fast growing businesses out there. You can pay those, those investors a dividend. You allow them to have a portion of your you know, capital and growth. I mean, this is fantastic. This is capitalism at its finest. It allows entrepreneurs like yourself the ability to access money out there. It allows investors to invest in dynamic businesses. And ultimately, it becomes kind of a, a big competition to the Wall Street you know, investment banks because you can bypass the whole IPO process with an STO. So I, I, I think it's going to have you know, huge implications for all of society over the next 10 plus years. No, and I appreciate that too. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I'm obviously in agreement with you since we launched this thing, but you know, since we've launched it, we've seen a lot of more businesses doing the same thing. And what I love about this, Ed, really quick, is you know, people think, oh, I can get into you know Lyft or, or you know Facebook and in Alibaba. When you're getting in these names, you're getting in, and when you know the biggest growth of their companies already took place, and you know the liquidity event is the IPO, which you know, insiders are actually selling those shares to you and people want to buy these things at multi-billion dollar valuations when, you know, STOs, I think, give you an opportunity to really look. It's more speculative, but you could really get into some cool businesses during this super early growth phases. And that's how, you know, you could really make a fortune by you know, buying the Amazons very early on, which you did have a shot to do with Amazon, but not today, right? All these unicorns wait till they have multi-billion dollar valuations to go IPO. It's kind of crazy. Right. I, I couldn't agree more. And you see that happen with Lyft after their IPO, the stock trades down and the investment banks are happy because they scoop the big fat fees, the VCs, the venture capitalists and the private equity guys. They're happy because they're getting a liquid exit. And they're selling stock to the sucker retail investor who's going out and, you know, buying Lyft on the, in the aftermarket. And you, I think you, you definitely have a lot more opportunities getting in at these early stage uh, entrepreneurial companies like yours uh, to get in on an STO there than some of these mega unicorn IPOs. No, I definitely appreciate that. And I love the fact that we did uh, compete when it's to cryptos because this is something that I know you're very familiar with. You've been in the investment banking industry for almost you know over two decades, and, and I know you're very familiar with this uh, the entire sector. So I appreciate you commenting on this. Uh, yeah. With that said, and listen, you came on a short notice, which I really appreciate. Uh, you know, I saw this news and said, hey, I think this is a good idea for you to come on. And you came on right away since this announcement of Ryan Zinke was yesterday. And uh, I really appreciate you, everyone, you know, giving us an update. And uh, hopefully you'll join us again soon and, and things would be really, really great. And the next time you join us, that stock will be a lot higher. But I'd love to keep in touch with you three, you know, three, four, five months from now and just, uh, you know, for you to come back and definitely give us an update on what's going on with your company. That'd be great. We really appreciate the interest. You know, all your subscribers, if they want more information, they can go to our website anytime. Frank, it's usgoldcorp.gold. I'd encourage everyone to sign up for the news releases right on there and just continue to follow the story.
It definitely makes sense, Ed. All right, buddy. So listen, I'll definitely keep in touch with you. Talk to you soon. And again, appreciate you coming on such short notice. Sounds great. Thanks so much for the interest. All right, guys. Great stuff from Ed. And look, I mentioned probably about three months ago that I'm going to give you a list of names to, to put on your watch list of junior miners, just companies that are really beat up, companies that I'm familiar with, uh, great projects, mind-friendly districts, solid management teams. You know, because we know this is a cyclical industry. It's been down for, man, six, seven years. Uh, you know, we're seeing gold right now, as I mentioned, you know, pulling back a little with the rally in stocks, but still, you know, holding up well. And, and this cycle is poised to change. And when it does, the list of stocks I've given you are, are not going to go up 100%, 200%. I mean, it doesn't happen. These names go up, you know, several hundreds of thousands of percent during bullish cycles. But from these levels, guys, you don't need a bullish cycle. You know, you just need stabilization, a little positive sentiment in the industry. And, you know, it would push these names up by 2x, 3x in the short term. And you may say, come on, that's a little crazy. You go back to early 2016. I mean, you go back to the, to my podcast, like everything's recorded, everything's archived. Even people that sign up for my newsletter, it's, you know, we give, you know, Curzio um, Research Advisory, we give 30-day money-back guarantee. And, you know, I, I urge investors, hey, when you go in there, look at all of our past reports since I've been writing. I mean, everything's there, all of our archives and everything. There's nothing to hide. It's not like, oh, we're going to get rid of this and you don't know what's going. No. See, all my recommendations, a few of the bad ones, most of them are good. We're doing well in both portfolios. But when you go back to 2016, even listen to this podcast or look at some of the recommendations, uh, and the stocks I told you to buy back then, like Northern Dynasty, McEwen Mining, Sandstorm Gold, Yamada Gold, and you're talking about enormous, enormous gains in just a six, seven month period. And the fact that every junior miner, even the ones with good management teams, great projects, again, mine friendly districts are down 60, 70, 80% from their highs. Yeah, at these levels, they offer an incredible risk reward where you could risk 35%. That might be a lot for some of you, so only put a little bit of money into it. Again, these things are volatile, but you're risking 35% to make several hundreds of percent by buying some really good names right now. So, yeah, just another name I put in front of you. This is a smaller name. I do not have a position in it. Uh, so, you know, right now I don't have a position in the stock at all. But again, this is a stock that's on my watch list, a company that I like. And I love investing in junior miners where, you know, from a risk reward basis. And Nevada Exploration, I talked to you about on resources I had on. I mean, these are companies with, you know, you risk a little bit to make a lot. And that's what you want when you invest in junior miners. It's money that you should be able to afford to lose. But if you're right, it could be life changing. And that's pretty cool. And this sector right now offers that with how depressed it is. And maybe, you know, it takes a while and maybe you'll stop out. We stopped out a couple of names. But if you look what happened in 2016, I mean, easily covered the losses that we've taken in this sector over the past two years, trying to pick off a couple of really great names. But again, the sector's in, in a decline. It's not pretty right now, but these are names I want you to put on your watch list because when gold does come back, and it will, it's a cyclical industry, and man, it's way past, I mean, you usually see cycles three, four years, not six, seven years, uh, especially on downturns. And you know, when this thing turns, you have an opportunity to make a lot of money in many of these names. Now- I always say this podcast is about you, not about me. So let me know what you thought by emailing me at frankcurziorresearch.com. That's frank at curziorresearch.com. Now let's get to my educational segment. Because we had Netflix report on Tuesday after the close, and the stock went down, I think, four, five, six percent. And then it opened kind of flat, where, you know, kind of is it today? IBM went down 3%, even though they reported solid numbers. Yeah, they saw, you know, revenue growth, a little bit of margin, you know, revenue uh, decline. Year over year, that's not a big deal. People focus on that metric at IBM all the time. They're getting out of like their legacy businesses. I mean, their earnings and profits are going higher and higher. Their revenues are going lower, but the businesses that they're getting into are much, much higher margins, so their profits are increasing. Uh, dividend is safe, very large dividend. I think this stock is a buy and a pullback since they're acquiring Red Hat, which Red Hat reported their numbers uh, a couple weeks ago, growing top and bottom line by double digits, increased the amount of $1 million plus orders by nearly 20% the same time period from last year. So, you know, I think IBM is a buy here, but the purpose of this segment is I know, because I get emails from you all the time, that so many love, so many love betting on stocks ahead of earnings, whether it's simply buying shares or shorting the stock or using option strategies to try to make quick returns. Now, I always said that betting on a stock ahead of earnings or trying to predict which way the stock's gonna move based on three months of data, right? You don't know if they had good three months or bad three months or whatever, it's kind of a fool's game because it's basically a guess where you could be right on the company long term you know, as that long term cows come to fruition. But if you buy a stock at 50 and you know, report terrible earnings and the stock goes to 40, 
it would kind of be nice if you were buying it at 40, your average cost basis was 42, 43, then being at 50, that's a big difference if that stock goes to 60, which would be 50% gains buying them at 40 compared to, you know, buying at 50, sitting on the losses. You know what I mean? You know where I'm going with this because you can get crushed early on if the company simply reports weaker than expected earnings and reduces guidance for next quarter. With that said, it's a fool's game, <laughs> but I'm going to try to put the odds in your favor when it comes to betting on stocks just before the report. Okay, it's I know investors love the action. I've done it before. You know, investors love that game. They want quick short-term gains on a stock that's definitely going to have lots of volatility after they report earnings. And I want to try to help you out because while I don't do this often, the few times that I do go in and either buy or short a stock, whether I'm using options or not, I'm right most of the time. Not bragging here because I cover my losers, but there's certain things that you need to follow if you're going to do that. It's very, very important, guys, especially in this market because in this market, expectations are kind of high. And if you miss and report weaker than expected guidance, your stock gets nailed. You know, IBM's numbers are pretty solid, and the stock's down 3%. Yes, it's run up tremendously, which is the point I'm going to get to in a minute. But you have to be conscious of what that stock is doing ahead of the quarter. Has it run up tremendously? Are expectations sky high into the quarter? That's a big deal because if the company reports pretty good numbers and increases their guidance a little bit, that stock could still take a hit because it's up 20% heading into the tape before they report earnings. And vice versa, if a company's down tremendously going into the quarter and expectations are low, you just need a company to report inline numbers. I mean, maybe they report a little bit weaker guidance and you can see that stock pop 10, 15%, especially if they announce a huge buyback or the initiative to close stores if you're a retailer and save money. I mean, you can see these things pop 10, 15% from those levels, even though earnings aren't that good. And you need to know that before going into you know, buying a stock before the report earnings because it makes all the difference. We're talking about trading, guys. It's very, very important. And again, we looked at Netflix. If you look at Netflix specifically, the stock went from 366 to 344 after Disney announced their new streaming service last week. Even though Disney will not take any market share from Netflix, at least for, for many, many years, right? You know, Disney's what are they spending like a billion dollars on that platform compared to Netflix, which is spending, you know, 10 times plus that amount. And even though Netflix has the best original content in the entertainment industry, and some of it hasn't been that great lately, but people love watching that stuff. And if I look at Disney, you know what? Most of the people watching the superhero movies at the theaters, right? And that's the content that's going to be online, but it's the original content that people love. When you start talking about Ozark and, you know, diff different, you know, just Orange is the New Black. I mean, just different things like that. People love that stuff that you're not going to find anyplace else. And Netflix has done a great job locking up some of the best directors, a lot of great actors. You know, again, they're spending a lot more money on this platform. The stock I thought took a hit that I really didn't deserve. And the stock fell, right? So you're looking at lower expectations into the quarter. Ran up a tiny bit because someone upgraded Netflix Deutsche Bank on the day uh, that they reported, which is surprising. But sentiment was overall negative for Netflix. They reported numbers that were not that great, right? They reported a big beat. They lowered the expectations. Their subscribers were kind of in line, a little bit lower than estimates. But, you know, they forward guidance. They actually lowered their earnings guidance significantly, which is surprising. So the numbers weren't that great, but Netflix held up pretty well. Now, if they beat the numbers, the stock would have went a lot higher. And that's the point I'm trying to make here. So when it comes to Netflix... It's a stock that had you know, just started declining sharply into the tape, which lowered expectations. The company didn't really report great numbers, and you know what? You didn't really lose any money because the stock's kind of flat today on Wednesday. And you want to look at that because if Netflix was running up 20%, 30% into the quarter and reported this same quarter, the stock would be down 10 12 15% today. So know this going in. Now, how do we translate this into – what we're going to do going forward? Well, next week is full-blown earnings. I mean, it's going to get pretty nuts. Saying it, it, probably over 100 companies reporting next week. So about Halliburton, Coca-Cola, Snap, eBay, Procter & Gamble, Lockheed, Verizon, AT&T, Biogen, Goodyear, Tire, Thermal Fisher, Portly, Facebook, Microsoft, Visa, Bristol-Myers, lots of home builders reporting, lots of oil companies, including Chevron, Exxon, you have... Illumina, Intel, UPS, Starbucks, Amazon Capital One. Again, just off the top of my head. <laughs> I just copy and paste that. But there's a lot more companies reporting. Now, out of that whole entire list, which I promised to give you, I want to focus on a few of them. 
Like when I'm looking at Snap, right? Which was six dollars in January, right? Social media. And I'll bring it up right here. So you're looking at a company that is trading close to 12 bucks now. And this, everybody knows the IPO. It just, you know, got crushed. And it's at $6 now, right? So it got, you know, it was at $6, I don't want to say how long ago. This is in January. So you're looking at $6 in January. It's now close to 12 On positive news, if finding ways to monetize that platform, if you want to look at this stock and you think about buying ahead of the earnings, I'd be careful. Because they, they need to report solid earnings and guidance, or this one gets nailed. Right? Everyone's on shaky ground with this company, and they're like, wow, they're just starting to get into it. Things might get better. Maybe it's Facebook buying it at 30 when it came out of the IPO at 50, went to 30, and now it's where, 175. So that's what people are thinking, or investors are thinking. But since this all happened relatively quickly, I mean, this is a very important quarter for the company. And if they beat, I don't know how much it's going to go up when you're up 100% in three, four months. But if you miss... I mean, this is, and I can see them reporting inline earnings and inline guidance to the stock falling by 5%. I mean, that's not what the street is looking for when your stock's up 100% going into the quarter. They're looking for something much, much more positive. Expectations are sky high right now. So inline earnings, inline guidance, which a lot of management teams right now are reporting, right, when it comes to guidance, they're being conservative because you have Brexit, you have the trade tariffs with China that's going on, not too sure about economic growth. Is China's numbers are getting better? Is it for real? Could it stabilize? You know, and that's a growth engine of the world. So there's a lot of uncertainties out there, special currencies and things like that if you operate overseas. So they've been very conservative and not being rewarded for that because we're seeing the whole market go up into this earnings season. Very important. So taking a few names off that list, Snap's one of them. Let's go with Bristol Myers. It was 55 six months ago and reported really bad earnings. I think it was last quarter, quarter before. Now it's at 45. And so it's trending lower into the tape. Expectations are super low. Again, a company, if you're going to bet, I'd bet that, hey, just figure that they're going to report inline guidance and inline numbers. Because if it's really bad, usually companies come out maybe a couple of weeks before and they'll say, hey, we're not going to make the quarter. You know, it, it, it looks bad for the quarter. It's not going to work out. <laughs> you know, the numbers are going to be horrible. And a lot of companies do that two, three weeks before the report. And that's fine. You'll see the stock fall. The fact that it didn't do that kind of gives you an indication that it should be kind of in line and the guidance should be okay. And if Bristol Myers reports in line guidance and in line numbers, you could see the stock pop more than 5%. If they report great numbers, this thing will really pop higher. And that's where you can make a lot of money. Again, you want to look at this stuff into the quarter. I say it's a fool's game, but you want to put the odds in your favor. You want to have the best risk reward returns for your investment. And if you're buying something that's going higher into the quarter, tremendously, expectations are high. And even if that means I got to report better than inline numbers, better than inline guidance, or the stock's going to get hit a little bit like IBM did, which is fine. IBM's going to come back and you know go a lot higher. Looking at Microsoft, a company that was 100 in January, it's 120. I think it's the largest company in the world based on market cap right now. Maybe you know close with Apple back and forth. But there's another one where I see you know a small beat inline guidance quarter, and the stock may fall by three, four percent because expectations are so high. There's an that ran up tremendously. So let's see how that cloud business is doing and how everything's going. But man, they really have to report blowout numbers for this thing to, to, to you know, blow past this. With that said, and I'm going to bring up Amazon. So I'm taking some of these stocks off the list. This, this is a pretty amazing free educational segment here because I'm giving you lots of names of what they're going to do next week when they report. So I could be wrong, and I love doing this because at frankcrazyresearch.com, you can send me emails and see which ones I'm right and wrong on. But Amazon is another name that I think you need to stay away from. Because it's a company that can really pay their earnings and blow out earnings, right, which we've seen in the past. Because they're not used to reporting earnings. It's very easy, you know, financial engineering and stuff like that. They could report blockbuster numbers. And if the stock does rise to its 52-week high, which is around 2050, it's not too far away from there now, I mean, you could see the stock run tremendously higher, right? I mean, we saw the same thing with Disney after it broke through its levels. That hasn't broke through in, in years. The thing really took off to, to like another level. So you want to be careful because you know if they don't report those numbers, yeah, the stock's going to get hit. But this is one where, if I'm betting against it and the stock has run up into the quarter, if I'm wrong and this thing, and that's what you want to look for with a lot of these stocks, are they trading close to their highs, their all-time highs? Because if they surpass that, they report blockbuster numbers, a new deal, they announce this 
you know, major buyback or a major increase in their dividend, a special dividend payment, you know, you could see these things really take off through their highs and then you get nailed. So I'd be careful with that one. Uh, one more name I want to give you is Goodyear Tire. I mean, Goodyear Tire, if you're not familiar with it, Mike Alkin nailed this one. One of his first recommendations is short through using conservative option strategies in his Money Flow Trader newsletter. He was dead right. And this stock was trading over 30 at the time, uh, fell to 17 within a year. And the stock has a little momentum heading into the quarter. It's up about 15% from its lows over the past month. So, but the expectations on this name are incredibly low now. And they reported, I want to say like three bad quarters in a row. <laughs> it was just like all over the place. And, and Mike really nailed it because the numbers that they were reporting were showing numbers in Venezuela where inflation was just, you know, crazy stupid. And they were reporting how they're showing growth in certain areas. He's a forensic accountant, really broke this name down, did an incredible job. But when I look at this name, expectations are super low on Goodyear Tire. So a name that if they just report inline guidance and assume that because they didn't come out before the quarter and tell you that they were missing guidance or anything like that or, or not going to make the quarter. But when they do report, if assuming that they, they're in line and you know they have conservative guidance and just say, hey, you know what? This is in line with analyst estimates. I can see this stock going up you know, over 5%, maybe 10%. At the report good numbers, you could see it go up even further. Again, this is a company that was trading in its 30s. It fell to 17, and it's 20 bucks right now. So these are the companies that are going to report next week. I know a lot of you love buying this stuff, and sometimes I do it too. I did it with Tesla a couple of quarters ago. Everybody hated the company. I knew or I just had a good indication that Elon Musk was going to tell everyone what they wanted to hear. This is like two quarters ago, maybe three quarters ago. And, and the stock surged, and I did very well you know, playing options. But was, sometimes I see ideas where everyone's just leaning to one side, like a Goodyear tire, where everybody kind of hates the stock, and they should, and you know, perform terrible, and all the investors who sold it are probably out of the stock. They hate it. They don't want to know anything about it, which means this company only has to go from you know, bad to less bad, and you could see a, a 10 15% pop in the stock. So that's how it would play going into earnings season. Just know that most companies are going to report their guidance. They're going to be conservative. I don't see anyone really raising their guidance like crazy because a lot of uncertainties. And we've seen companies get a little punished for being conservative because they've run up since January. So just be conscious of all these things. A lot of different factors. Hopefully I didn't lose you, you know, going through a lot of things. Again, we just covered a lot of names. But I wanted to show you how, how I play earnings season. Again, I, it's a dangerous game. Only do what money you can afford to lose. It's more of a trading strategy. But if you're going to do it, I'd rather explain to you how I do it and how you know, I've done very well by being smart, being very selective. I don't do it all the time. But if I'm going to do it, you have to pay attention to that sentiment going into the quarter and how the expectations. Is the stock up or all the analysts bullish on it? Because almost no matter what they report, that stock could take a hit of 5% because it's run up tremendously into the quarter and vice versa. If the expectations are low. You just need that company to report inline earnings, inline guidance, and you could see that company take off 5%, 10% because it's down so much and expectations are low heading into the quarter. Woo, that's a pretty long and detailed educational segment with lots of ideas, which I know you guys like, but let me know what you thought about that one at frankcurrentsresearch.com. And guys, that's it for me. Thanks so much for listening. Always say this, always mean it. Really appreciate all your support. Continue to email me, in. send me emails whenever you guys want. Love you guys. Really appreciate, again, all that support. I'll see you in seven days. Take care. The information presented on Wall Street Unplugged is the opinion of its hosts and guests. You should not base your investment decisions solely on this broadcast. Remember, it's your money and your responsibility. Wall Street Unplugged, produced by the Choose Yourself Podcast Network, the leader in podcasts produced to help you choose yourself.